Okay, so I take it everybody saw the videos that I sent out. Saw the videos? Saw yes. the videos? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, there will be more. Um, every week uh, I'm going to be recording the class on my camera. And along with that, um, particular questions that I think everybody might get something out of, uh, I, I will probably be able to do a short tutorial video as I did with the malware bites because I think everybody can get something out of that one. So that's why I did it. It was, uh, I forget whose question it was. I think it was yours. Yeah. Um, so I will be keeping in the back of my mind questions that come up. I think everybody can get something out of. So there'll be maybe a five, six, seven minute video about how to handle that. All right, today, um, how many of you have Microsoft Office on your computer? Lost it? You have it and you've paid for it. But you, did you did you pay for it? It's is it active? You have to pay for it. Well, then it's, I must yeah. pay for it. I, I mean, like Bill yeah. Fisher put all this stuff on yeah. for me, so I, I guess I yeah. paid for it. And put it on. All right. Uh, today I'm going to deal with uh, a, a piece of software that will do everything that Microsoft Office does. And it's for the low, low price of free. The low, low price of free is good. This is uh, open source software. When, when we say open source, what we really mean, it's not free software, it's open source. And what we really mean is that uh, some geeky person a long time ago found a problem that he decided to overcome himself. And the, prob the problem with all of these open source office suites is that nobody wanted to pay for Microsoft's offering. So the open source community went to work and they decided that we can make an offering in programming that will do everything that Microsoft Office does. It may be, some things may be crippled, not working quite right. We don't have, uh, we can't reverse engineer the software. We're just looking to see if we can make it the same. And that's what they've done. And for a long, long time, I recommended OpenOffice as a source for an office suite that would do everything that Microsoft Office does. OpenOffice has not kept up. It's pretty much crippled itself at Office, Microsoft Office 97, 2003. It's pretty much stopped its development. But LibreOffice, L-I-B-R-E, Office, um, has continued the trend of keeping up with all of the latest stuff that's built into Microsoft Office, particularly the uh, the docx format now all that means is is that there are uh, in the docx format and the excelx format uh, there are provisions in there to put hidden commands inside the software to allow extra things to happen in the software um, do you need them would you ever use them no but docx is now the preferred manner in which to make a document, an Excel spreadsheet, and um, a presentation uh, PowerPoint. So LibreOffice is the only one that's kept up. And today, I'm going to show you how to download it and install it and configure it. It's really, really easy. Oh, yes, you can put it on an old computer. Yeah, yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, now, your computer might not have enough horsepower to run it properly. This is for like um, later computers. Even Microsoft, uh, even Vista will run Libra properly because it has enough horsepower. It has uh, enough CPU cycles and it has enough memory. But yours, no. Okay. Yeah. 
But keep this for future reference when you yes. get a new computer. Yes, I know. So the first thing we're going to do to begin is we're going to hook up to the internet, which I have not yet done. I was busy with other things. And we're going to connect. This will take a minute or two. Sorry. I'll edit this part out. There we go. It's connecting to the internet. We'll close that. Okay. So, once again, we go to the internet to find this program. And the quickest way to do it is to open Google Chrome. And in the search bar, or Google Chrome, type in the word L-I-B-R-E, and it gives you a suggestion LibreOffice. That's, that's what you're after. So we'll go there, click on that. It searches down. And it, now, in this instance, it's going to take you right to the download page. You can go to the main page and search around, but it's going to take you right to the download page. That's a good thing. By the way, LibreOffice is available for download from places like CNET and Download.com. Please don't go there. You will be loading crapware along with the program that you want. Yes, you can use Bing, but, but go, yeah. go to, when you're searching for software, go to the author's website if you can, if it's available. Don't get them from download.com, cnet.com, or any of the other downloaders because you'll wind up downloading crapware along with the program that you want. The only, the only other um, exception that I would make to this is the one I told you about to get malware bytes, and that is majorgeeks.com. You can go there to get software. They don't load crapware with it. So Major Geeks is another one, but I don't know whether they have LibreOffice. They might. In any event, we go to the download page, and there it is, download version 4.4. Click on download, and it down it will come. I'm going to not do that because I have already downloaded the program. It's a little bit large. And I didn't want to take the time, so here it is, LibreOffice, my latest download. And we can right-click on that and click Install. It's a big program, and it takes a few minutes for it to install, like even getting it to start installing. But it will happen. What it's doing right now is, is it's unpacking all the files to, um, to start the download. You'll get this, uh, this panel, uh, the run or cancel. You want to run it, and it's preparing to install. And when it's unpacked all the files, you can click on Next. In this event, in most cases, uh, even Microsoft Office, if you've ever installed it, you'll get... Um, a typical setup or a custom setup. If you want to exclude some things from this, you would go to custom, but always go with the typical setup. That way you know it's installed properly. It's going to create a link on the desktop, and in this case it's asking you LibreOffice uh, loads during system startup. Don't do that, because it will halfway load in the background, and that means it's taking memory resources to do that. It'll launch a whole lot quicker because it's already halfway loaded. But you don't want to do that. So just leave uh, the, um, the launch during startup un unchecked. And it creates a link on the desktop. And now it's beginning to load. Uh, here again, it's going to take a couple of minutes, even on a fast computer. This is a big program. If your friends send you a Microsoft Office document and you don't have an active copy of, of Microsoft Office, this is a way to open it. Oh. 
Exactly. Exactly. So if you're talking about a Microsoft document, an Excel spreadsheet, because sometimes people make documents in Excel spreadsheets and they send them to you as what's called an XLSX or XLS. It's, that's just Excel. Um, and this program will open those files that were created in Microsoft Office. Um, it's Yes, when you when you double click on the on the the uh, document, it will launch LibreOffice. And so you can read it. Now it's asking you your user account control, are you sure you want to do this? And we can click yes. And it's going through the install process now. Here again, takes a minute. It's a big program. Two hundred megabytes it is. It took me uh, about fifteen minutes to download it at my house. I wasn't on my fast, uh, my fast connection. It was on my slow connection. So, which is about what you have. So it takes ten, twelve, fifteen minutes to download it. My fast connection would do it in about thirty-nine seconds. And it's copying the files out of its folder onto the computer and going very slowly while it's doing it. All right, so the uh, program has finished loading. There, there we are, the big green button. Yeah, there are other there green is. buttons over here, but you don't need to know about them. Okay, now in uh, LibreOffice has put an icon on the, a shortcut icon on the desktop for us, and so we can launch it with that. Right click and open. Now the panel is presenting you with now is just asking you, what do you want to do? Do you want to make a document? Do you want to make a spreadsheet? Do you want to make a presentation? Or do you want to draw something or make formulas? Or You're only concerned with the first three. These are other added extras at a slight additional cost of nothing. So, but ignore them. And before we do anything, though, before we do anything, I want you to click on Tools, and I want you to click on options. Now, the open source community can't just say, okay, this is a clone of Microsoft Office and it will do Microsoft Office bidding automatically. They can't do that. It's all about digital rights management. So they have come up with their own form of um, an Office document in what's called the ODF format, Open Document Format, ODF. That's proprietary to the open source community. But they've given us an out to make it act just like Microsoft Office. And that out is in the load save. Under this list you will come down here and find load save. Click on the plus and then under general attributes of this program you can see that they've listed the default file format as ODF. Well, we can do things about that. The next two box lines are what, what do you want to do with a text document? Do you want it in the ODF text format? No. Go to the drop down box and you will see that it can be converted to Microsoft Word 2007, 10, 13 XML. 
or a template, or you can you can go back to 97, two, uh, 97, 2000, and 2003 for XP. That is the dot .doc format, not docx, dot .doc. But we want to go with the latest and greatest, so we'll click on 2007, 10, and 13, and the next one we'll do is the spreadsheet, and here again it's the ODF format for a spreadsheet. Click on the ground, the uh, drop-down box, and convert that to Microsoft Excel. And now we go to the presentation, which is PowerPoint. Again, ODF presentation, and we click on the drop-down box and convert that to 2007, 2010, 2013, and it's not a template. Uh, 7, 10, and 13 XML. That will give you the X format in Microsoft Office. It will be able to read it, understand it, and, and present you with everything that it does. And so we can give that an OK. Now how do we know that all of that worked? <laughs> well, let's open, let's open um, write a document, or writer document, that's what we're doing. We're... Yeah, okay, but how do we know that those changes we made in the options worked? Well, let's just put in some text here and do a save as. We know that it worked because by default it's going to save it as a Microsoft Word 2007, 10, 13 XML document, DOCX. That's how we know it worked. And so, um, I'm going to cancel out of this and just close this. Don't save the changes. And I'll launch it again to, so we get something else. The reason that we want to do it that way is that if somebody sends you a Microsoft Office document, then when you double click on it to, in your email or, or where, however you get it, when you double click on it, it will open in LibreOffice. It won't have to search around for a program to open me. It already says open me in LibreOffice. So there you go, there's uh, a really great open source product for the low, low price of free. It does everything that Microsoft Office does except mail. There is no mail client for this. Um, and I highly recommend LibreOffice for everyone. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, there is. There are no problems here um, with uh, malware, scumware in the background. It's all quite clean. It's um, yes. You go through all that preliminary stuff every time you want to no. Once you've set it, once you've set it to open as a Microsoft product instead of ODF, it's set forever. Well, if you make a document, you save it to wherever you want to save it, then you attach it as an email like you would any other way. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. So something has happened to that dynamically linked library, and it will have to be uh, fixed. I, I'll have to fix it. <laughs> Eventually, I'm going to come to your house, Brenda, and you, I'm going to pry your wallet open, and I will fix your computer. Bob, you said Tim is not going to have a, what we know Microsoft Office. It's going to be something else in the cloud or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, could we, so then we little people 
people would like to come download this instead. Exactly so. Use this instead of that. Exactly so. Yeah. 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 Exactly so. Because um, you, you are what you're buying is a subscription to Microsoft Office. And you don't own it. You are renting it. And if you only use it occasionally, what's the point? You might be paying, uh, while well, you're paying, what is $120 a year? So 10 bucks a month to make two documents or to read two documents? It's not worth it, folk. And this is free and it will serve you very, very well. Uh, any other questions about LibreOffice? There are no dumb questions. <laughs> Tell me what your question is. Whatever I do, we use, uh, make a document. I know it underlines the spelling words. Yes. And then, uh, then I go and try and find out how to spell it. I, used, I was accustomed to uh, spell, spell check and all that. Yeah. But I don't seem to find that on the page. Okay. Uh, have you, ordinarily when you use spell check, you have to right click on the, the, the red underlined word that seems to be misspelled. You right click on that and if spell check is working it will give you some options for that word. So if it's I before E except after C it will give you the word with the E before I. Okay, LibreOffice. That's about that for LibreOffice. We have other questions? Concerns, stuff that doesn't work. The burner itself comes with your computer. And it has to be a CD DVD writer. If you don't have that, uh, the only other option open to you is to buy thumb drives, these things here. You can get, you know, you can get 8 gigs, 16 gigs. Well, a CD, a CD is only 600 megs. It's only 600 megs. A DVD is 4.2 gigs. So you can get these in, uh, in uh, 4 gig sizes or 8 gig, or 16, or 32, or 64 gigs, even 128 gigs, which is the size of, of a hard drive itself, a big hard drive. Um, and they're not that expensive. They're about, they're about 30 cents a gig to buy, sometimes even cheaper. And uh, you just plug it into a USB port and copy all the stuff to your, to your thumb drive. That's the easiest way. And the, they're available everywhere. Uh, if you're in Burlington, uh, you can go to, yeah, Walmart's okay. If you're in Burlington, you can go to Tiger Direct. Um, Tiger Direct usually has a sale on them. So you can get a couple of bucks off. Um, but yeah, try and get a name brand. In, in, um, you don't want to buy an off brand. Well, this one that I just sh showed you is uh, Patriot. That's a good brand of memory. Um, Crucial is a good brand of memory. Uh, Logitech, good brand. Um, Lexar is another decent brand of memory. Um, so, uh, but if you see in the display, uh, memory sticks, four gigs for eight dollars, and in the display there's other memory sticks, four gigs for three ninety nine. If you look carefully. It will be a name you do not recognize. <laughs> you can take a chance. You can take a chance. But these things are delicate. 
These things are delicate. You can lose the information from them. Leave them in your pants pocket, throw your pants on the washing machine, gone. I've done it. Eject, um, eject this thing improperly from the computer. You can damage the files that are on it, gone. So, uh, if you can, but if that's not practical, I mean, it's to, to buy a DVD player to have, have it installed on your computer, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you don't have one and you want to get one installed, uh, in your case, it will cost you more to put that player in and burner than the computer is worth. I'll get them to burn. <laughs> yeah, well, then you give them the files on a stick. On a thumb drive. Well, that's pretty difficult as well. That's, yeah. yeah. That's it. Yes, SanDisk is a good maker. Yes. You cannot get Netflix free. If a relative has Netflix on their computer, they can give you their username and password. And you can you can get, or he can buy what's called the family pack, where it can be played on other computers with a username and a password. So if you have a family member that has Netflix, a username and a password will work. However, if you're thinking for one minute that you're going to get Netflix USA instead of Netflix Canada, guess again. It will not happen. It's going to be a long, long time before you get House of Cards in Canadian Netflix. And it's coming at the end of the month and I can get it. <laughs> Binge watch the whole 13 episodes. I want to see what's going to happen tape? next. <laughs> Can you tape Netflix is a good question. Um, and the larger answer is no. Netflix and some of the other um, live st uh, streaming applications have fixed what we used to call um, the, uh, the analog hole. And the analog hole was simply the fact that if you were sending from a DVD player to a, to a television over a cable, you were sending the, the, the picture information, there were two ways to do it. With a VGA cable, which is analog, and a DVI cable, which is digital. The analog hole simply allowed you to put something in between your DVD uh, player on an analog cable and the television to capture what went through. Okay? The quality by design was poor. But that, and that was by design so that you don't get the high definition quality that you're stealing from your DVD. <laughs> they said, all right. We'll allow all of these people to just use the analog hole, but we're going to make sure the quality is crap. If you want to put up with it, that's the way it was. It has to do with digital rights management and the forest of woe that DRM is. There are so many standards of digital rights management and so many content owners and providers that um, use digital rights management differently in every case. Sony is different than Microsoft, than Netflix, and than Amazon, than Apple. They're all different.
in how they handle digital rights management. Uh, some of them are very vitally tightly controlled. Some of them, some of the others are not. They're just an inconvenience. Um, No. Yeah. No. Uh, and and let's be clear about what you own, what you rent, what you don't own, and what some and what you have paid to see. If you're using pay-per-view, WrestleMania. You are paying to view it. You do not, in any sense of the word, own the content. The content provider owns it. So WrestleMania owns the wrestling on pay-per-view. In the case of Netflix, even Netflix does not own House of Cards. House of Cards is owned by the production company that produced it. Netflix only buys the rights to stream it to their $8 a month users. In no way do you own what you're viewing. You are renting it from, from Netflix for $8 a month. You can watch it as many times as you want while it's on Netflix. You can watch it over and over and over again, but in no way do you own the content. If you buy, and as a matter of fact, if you buy a DVD and you want to make, in air quotes, a backup of your DVD, there's a bunch of legal hoops you have to jump through to say it's legal for me to do this. You pay 25 bucks for a DVD, and you drop it on the floor face down and scratch it, it's toast. It won't play. So what you want to do is make a backup copy of your DVD, put the original copy away somewhere, and never use it until you have to make another backup copy. Okay. Now, legally, do you own the content on the DVD? This is a very dicey question. The content producer would say, no, you don't. If you want to make a copy of that DVD and give it to a friend, that your purpose has changed. And so the content provider can say, you can't legally do this. I own the content, not you. I don't care how much you paid $2,000 for the DVD. I don't care. I own the content. Aren't they secured so you can't copy them, like from the library? Because that's right. Then, <laughs> then, the, then the DVD ripper that you're using is old technology. Um, it can be done, but you have to use newer technologies to do it. Um, it used to be at CDs were the perfect, music CDs were the perfect analogy for this. When you, bought, when you bought a music CD, it was copy protected. That you couldn't make a copy of it on your DVD burner or your CD burner. However, if you put your CD in, into the CD player and pressed play while you held down the shift key, the copy protection went away. <laughs> It was no longer copy protected. 
in that particular instance, you could then um, just move the music off of the CD onto the hard drive like it was any other file. Okay? So, have we come a long way in digital rights management? Yes. Have things gotten worse? Markedly so. Are they ever going to get better? Probably not. Exactly. I still refuse to be drunk. I took iTunes off. I found where it was, what it was stored, it's all, and I put MP3 rockets back on. Yep. How far did you go? You never know. All the ones that wouldn't go, and now on this. The. If you're using iTunes, <laughs> but if you were, um, iTunes has technology in it that stops you from doing this stuff um, because the content providers said to Apple in the first instance of how they wanted to do this, it, Apple wanted to sell you the, the music for a buck a tune. They would keep 30% give the content producer the rest, and the content producers finally caved and said, okay, however, you have to do this in such a way that once these tunes are on the computer, nobody can steal them from the computer and put them on another one. And that's where digital rights management came in. Apple had their own method of doing it. And so, a lot of times, if you bought music from the iTunes store and you were able to go into the folder and get it out and put it on another computer, it won't play unless you're playing it through iTunes, which was also authorized to play the tunes from the original computer. And as far as burning them goes, forget it. You can put them on an iPod, but only once. You are also backing up the digital rights management if you do it through iTunes. If you do it through any other way of just copying the, the, the files to another section of your hard drive, it's not working. You're going to pry your wallet open and help fix everything. It's the time. It's not the wallet. It's the time. It's time. Yeah. Okay. So we can talk on digital rights management and make me angry all day long. But we have to pretty much leave digital rights management there.